<laughs> Good morning. Emmanuel Darty shook hands with me earlier and gazed at my tie. I looked at his and I said, I see you have scarlet and gray on. I said, at least we're still undefeated. <laughs> Is that right, Charles? Brother Abby graduated from Penn State. And if you don't follow football, they beat Ohio State last Saturday. <laughs> but enough of that. I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here, appreciate Andy and the lectureship committee inviting me, and appreciate the good elders of this congregation who put forth the effort to maintain this school, uh, which is training young men to go out and preach the gospel and, and, uh, and the lectureship as well. You know, when I was younger, I suppose like all of us, uh, you think, well, I need to be invited to a lectureship because that means I've made it. You know, I lost that feeling a long time ago. Uh, young men, you know, we all, I guess, have that little bit of an ego when we start out. Young men, the sooner you can put that ego in the trash can, the sooner you'll be an effective servant of the Lord. And that's so true. And that, that's what it's all about. You know, I appreciate lectureships. Uh, I learn from them, uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. But, you know, for the most part, souls aren't saved at lectureships. They're saved back home in the trenches when we get involved in the lives of families and try to teach them the gospel and help them to grow and look forward to that beautiful home in heaven. I can't help but feel I've been given the topic the persistent widow, and basically it's about prayer. With the timeliness of this lectureship, I can't help but feel that this is perhaps the most important lesson in the lectureship. Because with the situation of our country and the upcoming election very soon, we need to pray. And we need to understand the importance of prayer. A boat left the harbor went out on the ocean, set out for a predetermined spot. When it got out there, they stopped, anchored up. The boat had a lot of equipment on it. Pretty soon a man began to put on an outfit, a suit. The suit covered his whole body and he put a helmet over his head and it was all sealed up so he was sealed off from the elements. He then slipped over the side of the boat, gradually descended to the bottom of the ocean, began to walk around, explore a little bit. What kept that man alive? What kept him from drowning in the ocean? We all know the answer. There's a line that comes out of his helmet that goes up to the top of the ocean, up to the boat above. And on that boat is equipment that pumps life-giving air through that line into his helmet so that he can breathe and stay alive while down there in that ocean. That's how I think of prayer. You and I are that diver. We're down here in this world surrounded by sin, surrounded by temptation, surrounded by the cares of life that just simply want to choke out of us the spiritual air that we breathe. But we have that airline, that lifeline, if you will, to the top through which we can talk to the Father and we can let him talk to us through his word. And just as that diver in the sea, if that airline is for any reason cut off, he won't live very long. The same with us. If we sever that lifeline of communication with the top, we're not going to live very long spiritually. It will cut off the very spiritual air we breathe. We need to understand how important prayer is. I believe it's that necessary to our Christian lives. This parable is found in Luke chapter 18. Just before that, in Luke chapter 17, 
Jesus spent time discussing his second coming as well as the coming of the kingdom. Well, verse 20 tells us that the Pharisees were asking him when the kingdom would come. He didn't directly answer him or answer them, but it was obvious they were looking for a different kind of kingdom than the one that our Lord promised and delivered. Similar to his disciples in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6, when right before he ascended from them back into heaven, they said to him, are you at this time going to, you know, reestablish the kingdom in Israel? And Jesus basically told them just simply, it's not the time for you to know. But he said, when the Spirit comes upon you, then you'll understand things. No, they were looking for a physical restoration of the kingdom of Israel. They were looking for a, a Messiah who would lead them like David into victorious battles against the other nations. And Israel would once again stand strong as a mighty nation. That's not what Jesus promised. That's not what he brought. That's not what God planned. God brought a spiritual kingdom instead. Jesus didn't directly answer them, but he did tell them that the coming of the kingdom was not physical in the sense that it could be seen. However, he did proceed to teach them the importance of preparing their lives and being ready for eternity. He told them that judgment was going to come. He told them that the wicked would be punished. And he even indicated this and illustrated it by a mental image of birds of prey gathering together to feast on dead bodies. Judgment will fall upon those who are morally dead in the sight of God. Part of that preparation, part of that faithfulness to God is in that airline to the top that constant prayer that is a part of our lives. We're not going to stay faithful to the Lord without it. And so he told this parable to them. And it says in verse, chapter 18 and verse 1, then he spoke a parable to them. The word then ties it in with what he had just talked about. And so he, he was telling them this parable to help them understand the importance of preparation. For that second coming, Jesus gave this parable to emphasize the importance of prayer and the fact that we should never give up praying to the Father. Then a lot of prayers go up for our country. We need a lot more. A couple of weeks ago, my wife and I were in North Carolina visiting with our daughter and her family. And the congregation where we attend when we're down there on Sunday morning, they announced that Sunday evening they were going to have a prayer service for our country. And so we were there on Sunday evening. And when we left the service, I told my wife, I said, these folks don't know what a prayer service is. <laughs> They had about four or five prayers, but the majority of the service, they had five or six men stand up and give short talks, basically. And I'm thinking, if we're going to have a prayer service, there needs to be less preaching to the choir and more talking to the Father. That's what prayer is all about. We need to be praying to God. And I think one thing we need to pray to God, and I've really not heard much of, uh, Brother Darty a while ago mentioned the fact that God intervened in the world. We need to pray for God to intervene in our country. Now we know God doesn't work miracles through men today the way he did in biblical times, but God's power can still work the way he wants it to work. And he can still intervene but maybe he doesn't have much reason to if we don't ask him, if his people don't ask him. And I think we need to do that. This country is in as bad a situation as it's been in my lifetime, and I'm sure the same for most of you in your lifetimes. I don't think I've ever seen an election where I've heard so many people not want to vote for anybody. And that's sad. But we need to be talking to the Father talking to him constantly. Brother Burton Kaufman wrote about 
this idea. He said this doesn't have a, a reference to a ceaseless bending of the knee or continuation without intermission in the utterance of petitions to the Almighty, but it's to an attitude of unbroken fellowship with God. That kind of attitude in prayer reveals one's complete dependence upon the Father in heaven for everything in life. And that's what he wants us to do. In the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses reminded the people what God had done for them while they wandered in the wilderness. He reminded them that their clothing didn't wear out and their shoes, they didn't need new ones. And, and God gave them everything. And he said that God did all of that to prove whether or not they would trust in him and follow him. God wants to know whether we'll do that or not, too. And a constant prayer life shows our trust in God and our willingness to rely upon him for everything within our lives. Brother Wendell Winkler edited a book, or he had a lesson in a book, a lectureship book a few years ago. And he quoted a man by the name of R.A. Torrey, and he said, Our whole life should be a life of prayer. We should walk in constant communion with God. There should be constant upward looking of the soul to God. We should walk so habitually in his presence that even when we wake in the night, it would be the most natural thing in the world for us to speak to him in thanksgiving or in petition. And Brother Winkler added, yes, we are to be in a prayerful attitude or mood at all times. And also... In that lesson, he said, there should be no group of people in the world who believe more devoutly in and practice more regularly the fine art of prayer than members of the Church of Christ. Do you think such obtains, he said? As James Moffat expressed it, we must be known more for our prayer life than for our degrees. How is my prayer life? That's the question we all must ask ourselves. Do we depend upon God for everything? Jesus said here, he, sp he spoke a parable to them that they always ought to pray. What about that word ought? Well, that word can mean a lot of things. The word ought sometimes, depending on its spelling, can mean zero. But we use the word to kind of say, well, I should go to bed. I ought to go to bed, but don't really have to. It's my choice. That's not what this word means. It comes from a Greek word, deon. And it suggests that it is necessary to always pray. It's not just a suggestion, but it's something which is binding. And so tie that in with what we've already talked about. Jesus is telling them to prepare for his second coming, to stay prepared, to stay faithful. And he is saying that prayer is necessary for that to happen. We must keep that airline to the top open if we're going to be able to stay faithful to him and maintain that prayerful relationship. We're introduced to a couple of different people in this parable. Of course, we have a widow. Widows are always um, helpless in some ways. You know, someone who has been married for many years and they, they lose their mate, they've lost part of themselves. The Bible says we become one flesh. You lose part of yourself. And with a widow especially, with a woman, many times the husband is, is uh, the wage earner in the family or maybe the main wage earner in the family. And sometimes when he's gone, times can get sort of tough. This widow has been wronged and is, she is seeking justice for herself. She says in verse number three, pulpit commentary had a statement that said the petitioner was a woman and a widow, the latter being in the east, a synonym for helplessness. With no one to defend her or plead her cause, this widow was ever a prey to the covetous. When a person is striving to live righteously, unjust situations are going to take place. It's true not only for individual Christians, but it's also too true for the church as a whole. 
And in the last few years, we begin to see more and more different ways that the world wants to persecute Christians and the church. And just like that widow, the church has no one to plead her cause other than Christ. Romans 8 verse 34 in the English Standard Translation, Paul wrote, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who, at, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. That widow needed, she didn't have anybody. She had to go to that judge. We have somebody. We have our, our spiritual brother, Jesus, the Son of God. I've often talked about the decay of our country, especially concerning moral issues, and, and especially in the last 10 to 15 years. It just seems like it's a great big old snowball rolling down a mountain, getting bigger and getting faster by the moment. It's just amazed me. Things that we've seen in the last 10 years, I never in my lifetime 30, 40 years ago ever thought I would see. Maybe we just had our heads stuck in the sand, so to speak. But there are things we are seeing today that we could never imagine, I don't think. And it's just getting faster and growing bigger all the time. But we have that promise in this parable in verse number 7. Shall God not avenge his own elect? who cry out day and night to him. God is there to help. He's there for us. The justice might not come immediately. And maybe it won't even come until eternity. But it will come. In verse 7 there he also said, Though he bears long with them, God is patient. And God gives us justice in his time frame. We want it, you know, the old saying, give me patience and give it to me right now. Well, we want God to answer our prayers right now. The way we want them answered. Sometimes he doesn't answer them the way we want. And many times they're not answered in our time frame. Warren Wearsby made a statement that I, I liked. He says, God's delays are not delays of inactivity, but of preparation. I like that. God is preparing us. Can we understand that God knows what's best? That's hard. Because we think we know what's best for us. But God knows what's best, and he's going to do what's best for his own. He wants to make us stronger and prepare us to face some of the things that we're going to face in the future. But we need to face them with reliance upon him and be persistent in that prayer and that faithfulness and wait upon him. And then we have the judge. The judge in this parable, parable we're told, doesn't care about God. He doesn't care about man. He only cares about himself, obviously. Johnson in Johnson's notes said the judges of the East are irresponsible, often unjust, and usually delay justice for the sake of bribes. Well, this widow had no way to pay him a bribe. So she just kept nagging him. Husbands know how that is, right? You know, your wife nags you enough, you finally do what she wants done. That's an old joke, but I don't think it happens most of the time. Once in a while. And so he finally decides to grant her request just to get rid of her. Just so she won't bother him anymore. This further reveals his selfish attitude. He wasn't helping her for her sake. He was helping her for his sake. Desiring his own peace. Unconcerned about her whatsoever. It's easy to see in this parable a reflection of the church and her relationship with God and also Satan being involved. Satan, like the judge, cares only about himself. He doesn't care about anybody else. He cares nothing for God or man. The church, like the woman, has no recourse of her own to provide 
help and salvation from the problem that faces her. The problem of the church is sin and the penalty of sin, which is spiritual death, separation from God for eternity. The only way to have redemption is through God and the cleansing blood of Jesus. But unlike that judge, God is always there awaiting us to turn to him. This judge was afflicting a widow. That was wrong. A widow is often defenseless against the problems she faces. And, but God has always expected compassion upon those who are helpless. The widows and the orphans constantly we read about in his word. Isaiah wrote in chapter 1 verse 23, Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. They didn't care. God was very specific about it in the Old Testament law. We find him saying in Exodus chapter 22, You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way, and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath will become hot, and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. That's pretty strong. You know, there was some strong language in the Old Testament. Wasn't there? A child who cursed his parents was put to death. There'd be a lot less children around today. If that were still in force. be a lot less people around today, period. If the Old Testament law was still in force. In the New Testament, of course, we know how God described pure religion over in James chapter 1. In verse number 27, he said, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit, or in other words, help, the orphans and the widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's pure religion before God. Dan talked about doing things a while ago with the Good Samaritan. The importance of doing things. Showing our faith in God. The Hebrew writer talked a lot about that in chapter 11 of Hebrews, didn't he? Quite a contrast we see between this judge and God. Sometimes when we study the parables, we like to try to apply certain things to, to other things. And it's, it's hard to do sometimes. You can't do it directly. There's no way you can say this judge represents God because there's a huge contrast between this judge and God. The judge grants her request out of his own selfishness. We find what he said in verse number 5. Yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me, the new King James says. Well, the Greek, the, uh, Greek word there is hupopiazzo, uh, and it's a term used in fighting. Pugilistic term. And this phrase, she weary me, can be understood as giving me a black eye, as Barnes said in his commentary. Oh, he wasn't concerned about her actually hitting him, I don't think. He was more concerned about his reputation. We use the term black eye in that sense sometimes. Somebody gives somebody a black eye, they, they hurt their reputation. He was afraid the widow's continual coming to him would look bad to, to the people around or what she might even say to other people about him. However, in contrast to the judge, we're told in verse number 8 that God will avenge his own speedily. We know this is because of his love and his care for each of his children, for his church as a whole. That judge didn't care about anybody, but God cares about us. He wants us to talk to him. Why would he give us a parable telling us to do that if he didn't want to listen to us? Something that boggles my mind and I'll never understand it and you won't either. And that is every person in this world could talk to God at the exact same time and God would hear each and every individual prayer. No way we can understand that. But we know it's true. Because he cares. 
Lockyer in his book about the parables. He said, coming to our Lord's application of his parable, it may be surprising to find that he compares the dealings of God with those not of a good man, but of a bad man, a godless man. But this feature adds force to the parable. What a contrast between all the judge was and God is not. All that God is, the judge was not. God is exactly the opposite to all the judge was in character. And we can be thankful for that. God is ready to listen. The judge didn't care about God or man, but you know, those who do care about God also care about man. Albert Gardner said, who builds hospitals? Who builds and operates orphans' homes and homes for the aged? It's people who believe in and fear God. Those who fear God usually also regard man. That's so true, isn't it? We do it because God does it. We care because God cares. We listen to others because God is ready and willing to listen to us. And we need to talk to him. So what lessons can we learn from this parable? Number one, judgment's going to come. Preceding the parable, Jesus talked about that. It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 27. In Acts 17, Paul, as he was preaching on Mars Hill in Athens, he said, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but he now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He's given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. As Jesus closed that previous discourse at the end of chapter 17, by giving that mental image of the birds feasting, the birds of prey feasting on the dead bodies. We're assured that God is going to exact vengeance upon those who are dead spiritually. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 I believe are probably the scariest words in the Bible. It says, in flaming fire, he's going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not the frightening part I'm talking about. He said, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. That's the frightening part. We won't have the Lord's presence if we go to hell the one place God is not. You know something? Nobody has ever lived where God is not. No atheist has ever lived where God is not. Everyone that denies God has lived in a world where they enjoy many of God's blessings. But that verse says God's not going to be there. Eternally We'll be away from the presence of God. That's why the task of proclaiming the gospel is the most important task in life. The most important task. Secondly, we learn that justice is needed. Just as this poor widow needed justice to have peace in her life, God's children need redemption and salvation for eternal peace. Jesus brought peace. The shepherds announced it to, or the uh, angels announced it to the shepherds in the field in Luke chapter 2. Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. But that peace is only found in him and in his body, the church. In John 16, Jesus said, In the world you're going to have tribulation, but in me you can have peace. I hear people a lot of times pray for peace in the world. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But I am saying it's not going to happen. Because the only place he promised peace was in, in his kingdom. In the church. In Christ. And even the church is not going to be in complete peace in a sense. Until eternity is reached. Because even among our churches we have disagreements don't we? fallouts. At times there's even been splits. So there's not going to be complete peace. 
until eternity is reached. And when Jesus comes back, that will be accomplished. The Holy Spirit has been given to all who obey, according to Ephesians chapter 1. He's our guarantee that Christ is going to come back and take us to that beautiful home in heaven. And that we'll be fully redeemed. And it is in heaven that the marriage of Christ and his church will be culminated. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 7. We will truly be one in him and have that blessed peace that's beyond our understanding right now. Thirdly, we need to understand that persistent relationship is necessary. The justice, the salvation, the full redemption and peace can only come by having that continual persistent relationship with the one who created us. The judge of all. In verse 7, he talks about his own elect who cry out day and night to him. That's what God wants us to do. Cry out day and night to him. Talk to him. Keep that airline open so that we can breathe spiritually here upon this earth. Regardless of the hostilities and the problems we face in everyday life, we must never lose our faith in God and our dependence upon him. Can't lose that. This relationship is one that blossoms out of a humble spirit. And he gives the following parable in chapter 18 about the Pharisee and the publican. A man by the name of Oosterzee said the following about that parable. He said, the two parables of the judge and the widow, the Pharisee and the publican, although they perhaps were, were maybe not delivered immediately after one another, they constitute a complete whole. Both have reference to prayer. So yet so that in the first, believing perseverance before, in the second, a humble approach to the throne of grace is commended. In order to end like the widow, one must have begun like the publican. In order to act as recklessly as of conscience as the judge, one must have the heart of the Pharisee in his bosom. Kind of neat how they can all tie together. This is a call to the church to be faithful, not just us as individual Christians to be faithful and, and to continue in that relationship, but for the church as well to be faithful, to walk that narrow path, not straying to the right or to the left, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. God spoke through Jeremiah the prophet, of course, and he said in chapter 6, verse 16, Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it, then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Sadly, there are many today who still won't walk in the old paths of peace and salvation that God has given. Fourthly, we don't know when Christ is going to come back. The widow didn't know when or even if the judge would help her and give her justice, so she just kept coming to him. Christians are assured of God granting justice, but we don't know when that ultimate redemption will come. Matthew 24, Jesus explained only the Father knew when Christ would return. He said even the Son doesn't know. And the end of the world as well. And so again, he stressed the importance of preparation and staying ready for that coming and being faithful. Our parable says that God will avenge them speedily. And, and this is then used in contrast to the judge who only helped others when it benefited himself. God is helping because of his unselfish nature and his love for us. The word speedily could indicate two things. It could indicate a brevity of time, or it could indicate that when it happens, it's going to happen fast. But God, God will. He will act. He will avenge us. And we need to understand that. In God's sight, a thousand years are just like a day. It's hard for us to understand, but we need to try to view from God's perspective rather than our perspective. And that's difficult. But he's always ready and willing to help. But the last lesson, I think, will he find us faithful? 
Kind of an unusual statement at the end of the parable. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? He had told them he was going to come. His second coming, judgment was going to come. He said, you need to prepare. You need to stay prepared and be ready and be faithful. But when I come, am I going to find you faithful? Am I going to find you faithful? Gardner said Jesus is not commending the judge, but he is commending the widow for persistence. She had a just cause. She wouldn't give up. We often become tired doing right and quit. Galatians 6, 9 tells us not to, not to give up, not to quit. This widow didn't do that. Remember, the purpose of the parable is to teach that we should not give up, but that we ought, must, always pray so easy to stop praying. We're hindered in persistent prayer through, Gardner said, through pain, discouragement, doubt, secret sin, disappointment, or by being so greatly outnumbered. But yet the Bible tells us in this parable that men ought always to pray and not to faint. I've often said to somebody that doesn't believe in God, they, they look at somebody praying and they probably think they're crazy. I mean, they're talking to the air. But we know it's more than that. We know there's a creator, a father that we're talking to. We can't see him. But sometimes it's easy to forget about that and to kind of give up. Sometimes we look and think our prayers aren't doing any good. And so we quit praying as much. That's not the way to stay faithful. Men ought always to pray. It's necessary. Giving up isn't an option if we truly desire to live with God in eternity. The brethren to whom Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3 were becoming doubtful because they thought, well, the Lord hasn't returned yet. Maybe he's not going to keep his promise. And, and Peter was trying to encourage them and help them to understand he will keep his promise. Brethren in Thessalonica had similar feelings. And Paul wrote to them, basically part of chapter 4 and chapter 5, to, to strengthen their faith and encourage them not to give up. He said in verse, or chapter 4, verse 18, to comfort one another with the words that he gave to them. Encourage one another, strengthen one another. Persistence in prayer is a sign of faith in God. Johnson said, prayer is the utterance of faith. Prayerlessness is proof of unbelief. The Lord, pained by the unbelief of even his disciples, shows in these words what a burden to him is our unbelief. God will help us. And we need to understand that. Prayer is a safe haven from the problems of the world. Do we understand it as a way to feel safe and secure in the arms of a loving Father? Locker said, then praying, we are not to faint. If prayer is not immediately answered, we must not be discouraged. If dangers threaten us, our spirit must not flag or sink. If help seems to be deferred, prayer which the Lord inspires must be answered by Him. True-hearted souls are frequently tried by divine delay in answer to prayer and are tempted to give up the praying attitude. To all such, this parable speaks with an encouraging voice. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. The late Jim Valvano, former basketball coach at North Carolina State, won the national title one year. <laughs> he became famous for a little phrase in his battle or losing battle with cancer. He simply said, don't give up. Don't ever give up. That's what the Lord's telling us. He said, I'm going to come back. He said, I, there is going to be a judgment. He knows we're going to face trials of every sort while we await in life here upon this earth, just like that widow. He gives us everything he could possibly give us to aid us in our fight. He just says, don't give up. Don't ever give up. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for life. We thank you for blessing us in so many ways. Some that we often take for granted. 
Father, help us to appreciate. Help us to know where they come from and to always be thankful. Father, we're thankful that your son gave his life on the cross so that we might have that hope of eternal life in heaven. That we might have the forgiveness of our sins through our obedience to you. And Father, we're thankful for your grace, which is evident in your son, without which we cannot go to heaven. And Father, at this time especially, we ask you to intervene in our country. We realize there are just so many people in our country anymore who, who don't care about you. But Father, there are many of us who do. Many of us who try to serve you in the right way. Many of us who want to keep that airline open to you so that we can talk and breathe spiritually here upon this earth. But we want to be able to talk to you and we're thankful that you're willing to listen and answer. And Father, give us wisdom as we go to the voting polls next week. Help us make a good selection within the choices that we have. But Father, again, above all, we ask you to intervene in this country. Help us to get this country headed back in your direction once again. Give us wisdom, Father. We know that we need it so much, and yet sometimes we fail to ask. Forgive us, Father. Forgive us for not standing up for you at times when we should. Forgive us for not reaching out to others at times when we should. But Father, give us the strength we need to resist the temptation that Satan is continually putting before us. Father, continue to walk with us as we walk with you. Love us and care for us. When we're finished here, please take us home to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you're here today, and it is the habit that we offer an invitation after the morning session, also later on in the day. And if you're here today and, and you've never yet obeyed the gospel, perhaps something's been said today that would encourage you to do so. If you want to repent of your sins and confess your faith in Jesus and be baptized, buried in water to have your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus, everything's ready. There are those here who can help you with that. If you're here, perhaps a child of God who's been lagging in your faith and you feel that you need to come back to God, not been faithful to him. Do you need to keep that persistent relationship with him alive? And if you need the prayers of the congregation, again, there are those here who will be glad to do that. Maybe you need prayers for something else in your life. We need to understand the importance of prayer. And so today, if you're in any way subject to the Lord's invitation that he gives, you come while together we stand and sing.